from the palace at Uncle Studios in beautiful Southern California. Welcome to another edition of Work Comp Matters, the central location for all your workers' compensation, employment, and labor law matters. My name is Steve Appel, and I'll be with you for the next hour with some talk, some news, and hopefully some answers about Work Comp Matters. Thanks for being part of the show. And if you can break away from your work on matters, feel free to give us a call and clue us in with your questions, comments, and or concerns. The phone number worldwide, 818-357-4120. You can send an email to wcexaminer at aol.com. You can be old school and send a fax, 818-475-1437. With me in studio, my right-hand man, Mike Zima, my protege, Robert Ozeron, Scott of Uncle Studio is on the board. Halfway around the world, back in Munich, Germany, is attorney John Scalia. And back at WorkComp Central, making sure the whole damn thing goes right, is Jake Paris. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of WorkComp Matters. We're talking about the FBI. The FBI is a governmental agency belonging to the United States Department of Justice. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, formerly the Bureau of Investigation, is the domestic intelligence and security service of the United States and its principal federal law enforcement agency. Operating under the jurisdiction of the United States Department of Justice, the FBI is also a member of the United States intelligence community and reports to both the Attorney General and the Director of National Intelligence a leading United States counterterrorism, counterintelligence, and criminal investigative organization. The FBI has jurisdiction over violations and is also a member of the United States intelligence community and reports both to the Attorney General and Director of National Intelligence. Our first news story is on the FBI, and we're going to get to that in a moment. But, of course, we have to announce that uh, Work Comp Matters is brought to you by uh, A1 Law in Santa Monica Tickets. If you want the number one computer management system on the planet used by more workers' compensation attorneys than any other computer management system, give us a call at 818-357-4120 for your no-strings-attached money-back guarantee, $1 a day, A1 Law. And, of course, if you want those hard-to-get, sold-out, front-row concert sports theater tickets give our buddy brian a call at santa monica tickets at 310-395-8587 but um, we have to uh, thank you again uh, for uh, joining us uh, for uh, work comp matters Uh, of course this is the place where we talk about uh, california legalization of marijuana uh, the homeless uh, autonomous cars uh, occasionally uh, donald trump Um, we've got, uh, Robert with the financial report. I've got, where's Anna? We've got John Scalia with the international report. But right now, without further ado, the first news story based on the topic of tonight's show. He's my right-hand man. He keeps me in check and out of trouble at least 90% of the time, Mr. Mike Zima. Thank you, Steve. FBI, the FBI said Friday that it did not follow protocol after a caller submitted a tip about the Florida shooting suspect earlier this year. Nicholas Cruz, a 19-year-old who was previously previously expelled from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, confessed to opening fire on the school last week. At least 17 people were killed. Under established protocols, the information provided by the caller should have been assessed as a potential threat to life. The information then should have been forwarded to the FBI Miami field office where appropriate investigative steps would have been taken. Quote, we have determined that these protocols were not followed. Uh... No crap. I mean, no no S. You know what yeah. I mean? I, I yeah, mean, this is brilliant. The FBI is saying this. Sorry. Uh, Cruz is charged with 17 counts of premeditated murder. I mean, that is, that just lights my fuse. So. Yeah, I, I mean, you, in one sentence, you got to give the FBI props. They did not hesitate. They admitted within 24 hours that they screwed up. They didn't follow protocol. But then again, how many tips do they get that 
eventually turn out to be BS. You, you know what I'm saying, Robert? You, you want to give a little comment on that or whatever? Yeah, and I think in this case, the tip they're referring to his was his online comment, right? He made a, a comment in reference to a YouTube video where he, he signed posted, his name, I believe. Yeah, and he said that he was a professional school shooter in the future or something like that. Uh, I mean, obviously, that's worrisome, just the, the comments itself, ra- without the fact knowing that he followed through. But uh, it seems like it's something that should be followed up on that. You know, you're posting it. It's not uh, something that people regularly post. I mean, we're all on the Internet. We, we know what we post. Even uh, anonymously, people don't post now, stuff like that. Now, of course, we know that, that both of his parents are dead. And one of his friends from school went to the friend's parents and said, hey, we've got this guy. Both his parents are dead. Can he come to live with us? And the parents were nice enough to say sure. And apparently, so the story goes, he admitted that he had guns. And the the folks that took him in said, we know you have guns. We're going to put them in a locked gun safe and you can take your guns out with our permission apparently uh they didn't know that he took the guns out prior to shooting up the school he did not that wasn't the first time he had taken the guns out okay if they were in fact locked up because i saw a cell phone video of him discharging a handgun in his backyard toward a neighbor's property Okay, the last time I checked, that's a felony, right? (laughs) Absolutely, no question about it. You can't discharge a fire. You can't shoot at your neighbor's house. Uh, At least I think it's a felony. And and then there's the question of whether or not he's mentally ill and or mentally challenged. I've I've heard stories both. Uh, He looked lucid during his arraignment. Uh, that that's for sure. Well, a they lot of on. mentally challenged people look lucid. Well, the test is the McNaughton, but the McNaughton test can he tell right from wrong? Right, and, and, and Mike, j- just for the heck of it, what is the McNaughton test? That that the person be able to tell right from wrong. It's as simple as that. Uh, yeah, uh, man, I haven't taken crim law in a while. I got to be honest. There's a Daubert sense, test. There's a McNaughton rule. McNaughton's a big one. There's a few. Yeah, uh, there's a couple. Uh, and I always get the two confused if I'm not reading it right then and there. I do workers' comp now, right? It's something you know when you're doing criminal, but at past law school, it's you know you you confuse the two. But either way, uh, as far as the FBI goes, uh, yeah, in retrospect, uh, your hindsight's always twenty twenty. I can only imagine how many tips they get a day. It's true. Uh, some tips should be followed up because they have more weight than others. It's a matter of prioritizing. Exactly. Weight. I mean, this thing was corroborated the, like crazy, and they did nothing. Yeah, I, I, I think we all agree that all tips should be followed up, but as far as how thoroughly depends on the weight, as you were saying. Correct. I mean, if you see that he has prior felonies and he's making these threats, that's something that obviously needs to be followed up on. But if this kid has no prior felonies, he's 17 years old, you 19. might... Well, what well, well, time he makes the comments, I don't know how old he is, but uh, either way, he's a younger man, right? Uh, I don't know what his felony history is, but presumably the authorities weren't aware of it, if he has any. I'm well, not aware of it. 20 calls to his residence. The poli- uh, yeah, but that's not a felony. FBI won't know that people called. I mean, Well, then the locals dropped the ball, too. I believe, right? They didn't prosecute well, this stuff? Well, it stop? seems to me that everybody yeah. dropped the ball. Just saying. You can see if they're getting a lot of calls. First of all, if you're saying that the, he shot a, he discharged a handgun towards the residence of his neighbor. I well, mean, that's what I saw. That's a felony. That's something that, you know, yeah. anybody should prosecute. Now that he's a convicted felon, first of all, all those guns go away. Uh, well, according to the law, anyway. Uh, we don't, not in reality, right? right? In reality, the guns right. are physically still there. Right. But Could he's be. Yeah, Could possibly. Be. Or at least if they catch him with it and he's not you know, he killing people. To the yeah, now he's back in jail, and now yeah. he's a career criminal, right? And then we can uh, kind of wa- watch him what more. What about federalizing gun laws? I've heard that positive before. Well, f- gun laws are – now we're getting on a Second Amendment here. So uh, You know what? You know what? I'm, I'm, later I'm gonna, show? Uh, <laughs> no, actually, let's, let, let's do it later on this show. Right now, though, I want to get to John Scalia uh, because we had talked about in, prior, in the prior show whether or not John has an FBI file. 
and I have been waiting for John's response. And, of course, I heard it before. I sent it to you, Robert. Did you listen to it or no? I know, I, I know Mike has not I heard it. I did not listen not, to it. Well, well now you're going to get the opportunity. Halfway around the world, Munich, Germany, we've asked before, does he or doesn't he have an FBI file? Without further ado, 45-year attorney, he's still got his bar card, Mr. John Scalia, do you or don't you have an FBI file? Hi, this is John in Munich with the Work Comp Matters International Report. This week's segment is titled, Do I or Don't I Have a File with the FBI? As most of you know, I've been living in Munich for about four and a half years now, but one does not go to a different country and simply plop there and live there, even with an American passport, which is one of the most powerful passports in the world. It takes preparation. The preparations for my leaving began seven or eight years ago. I hired a firm to make sure that I could get EU citizenship and live permanently in Europe. While I was doing this, my sons made me make two promises. The first was that I would write my autobiography because they insisted my life had been interesting. And the second was that I file a request with the FBI under the Freedom of Information Act in order to get my FBI file. My older son, as you may know from prior podcasts, is a West Point graduate and had some experience with intel since he worked directly for one of the generals involved in the preparation of the Iraq invasion. What made my sons convinced that the FBI had been keeping tabs on me? Well, let me detail some of my political activities for you. When I was 18, I first worked a picket line protesting the lack of hiring black individuals at the brand, then brand new Jack London Shopping Square in Oakland, California. I know, it sounds hard to believe, but this was 1964, and times were different. I followed that up by protesting the Vietnam War. I was a columnist and editor of the newspaper at Santa Clara University. I had my own op-ed column in which I called the war a violation of the Geneva Convention, and I called it both illegal and immoral. When I went to Europe, I was best friends with Monsignor Leopold Ungar, who had been a Catholic chaplain despite being born Jewish, and had seen enough of war. Ungar was the head of Caritas Austria and was already giving humanitarian aid to North Vietnam, which meant he was being surveilled by the CIA for sure, and one time called me up to tell me that he'd been contacted about by me, or rather about me, by the American ambassador. But that's another story. I continued to protest the Vietnam War. When I got to law school at UCLA, I joined some activities that were coordinated by the Lawyers Guild of America, the most left-wing lawyers organization in the United States. They believe that the ACLU is the American Legion at a July 4th weenie roast, and the Lawyers Guild is the only lawyers organization that have ever been put on the subversive list by the AG. They went to court and got it taken off. In fact, it's so left-wing that I strongly suspect that the conservative, expensive Catholic law school which Robert went to doesn't even have a chapter. In addition, when America invaded Cambodia, I led a student strike at UCLA. That's right, not only did I go on strike, but I went down to the undergraduate classes and asked the professors for permission to address the students as to why they too should go on strike while America continued to perpetrate war crimes. I also, in law school, work with the American Indians. So what does all this political activity have to do with being surveilled by the FBI? Well, let me read you a quote about J. Edgar Hoover, the man who headed the FBI approximately forever, from 1935 until 1972. The quote says, he was found to have exceeded the jurisdiction of the FBI and to have used the FBI to harass political dissenters and activists. Hmm, think I qualify? Anyway, so I write my letter to the FBI and I get a letter back from them. The letter back from them convinced me that Senator Al Franken did not really give up his job on Saturday Night Live, but was working part-time for the Justice Department writing letters. Because it comes back and it said, we neither confirm nor deny that we had a file on you. Oh, really? Well, that's bureaucratic language saying, well, yeah, we had a file, but we can't lie under the law, but we can say we ain't going to tell you nothing. Okay, that's probably the end of it, right? No. The next sentence says, however, however, 
there's a however to this. It says, however, if we did have such a file, it was destroyed in 1992. Okay, not that we're saying it was or that we did. Wow, talk about a creative use of the subjunctive. Certainly that's the end of it, right? No, the next sentence says, nonetheless, even if a file was destroyed, the FBI had the right to pass information on to the NSA. But the only way you can get that information is to write them a letter. <laughs> okay, why not? So I write the NSA and I get a letter back from the NSA and it says, eh, we reviewed what the FBI did, they followed the law, you want to find out any more, sue us in federal court. So, my question to you is, do you think the FBI had a file on me? I know what my over 40 years of experience as a trial lawyer says, on which way the smart money would go. Anyway, that's the report this week from Munich. Thank you very much, John. We'll be back with some more talk, more news, hopefully some answers on work comp matters after our first, after our first musical break. How does it feel to be one of the beautiful people? Now that you know who you are, what do you want to be? And have you traveled very far, far as the eye can see? Baby, you're a rich man. Baby, you're a rich man too. You keep all your money in a good brown bag. Decide to do what a thing to do. How does it feel to be one of the beautiful people? How often have you been there? Often enough to know. What did you see when you were there? Nothing that doesn't show. Baby, you're a rich man. Baby, you're a rich man too. You keep all your money in a big brown bag. Lachlan and the Cherry Blue Storms, Baby, You're a Rich Man on Work Comp Matters. We're brought to you by A1 Law and Santa Monica Tickets. If you want the number one computer management system used by more workers' compensation attorneys than any other system on the planet, give me a call at 818-357-4120. And if you want those hard-to-get front row concert, sports, or theater tickets, give Brian a call at Santa Monica Tickets, 310-395-8587. So, guys, does John Scalia have or not have an FBI or had an FBI file? I think he probably had a file. I do, too. Probably had one. Uh, fairly boring, and they destroyed it. Yeah, really, really no big deal. You know, yeah. sure. I mean, I've, I've said before, I probably have an FBI file. Yeah, he sits there and, and thinks thoughts that are, you know, subversive to the government, but he doesn't really do anything other than move and hang out and tell people about it. So I don't see how he'd be a threat to have a current file. California insurance commissioners, strike that, California's insurance commissioner has launched an investigation 
into Aetna Insurance after learning a former medical director for the insurer admitted under oath he never looked at patients' records while deciding whether or not to approve or deny care. California Insurance Commissioner Dave Jones expressed outrage after CNN showed him a transcript of the testimony and said his office is looking into how widespread the practice is within Aetna. If the health insurance, if the health insurer is making decisions to deny coverage without a physician actually ever reviewing medical records, that's of significant concern to me as an insurance commissioner in California and potentially a violation of law. Aetna, the nation's third largest insurance provider with 23.1 million customers, told CNN it looked forward to explaining our clinical review process to the commissioner. You know, you take this story in California workers' compensation when dealing with utilization review. Sounds like you are I was going to say, an independent medical review. It's you are an IMR madness. I mean, arguably fraud, right? We'll see when uh, Mr. Jones gets around to the UR programs and uh, all of those providers make sure that they're following the MTUS. I I know this, that if I have Aetna as a work comp carrier, which, Mike, we don't have too often. Do they write comp? I I don't know. I don't think so. But if they do, I'm taking a third and I'm taking a second and a third look at it. Let me tell you. Robert, do you have a a news story in front of you or anything like that, my boy? I do. A U.S. judge in San Francisco last week said a former Grubhub Inc. delivery driver was an independent contractor and not the company's employee in the first case of its kind against the gig economy, which, which the company went to trial. U.S. Magistrate Judge Jacqueline Scott Corley said Grubhub did not control Rafe Lawson's work, so it was not his employer under California law. The Chicago-based company did not supervise Mr. Lawson, tell him when to work, what kind of transportation to use, or what routes to take. Grubhub, Uber Technologies, and other gig economies have based their business models on treating workers as independent contractors who are not entitled to minimum wage, overtime, workers' comp, or other legal protections afforded to actual employees. Last week's decision could influence a series of lawsuits across the country in which Lyft, Uber, and other companies are accused of misclassifying workers as independent contractors and depriving them millions of dollars in pay. Southern California authorities took steps this week toward shutting down a large homeless encampment and relocating hundreds of tent dwellers to model rooms, excuse me, motel rooms, under a court-supervised deal with lawyers who sued to protect the rights of the homeless. Scores of people hauling hauling suitcases and pet dogs lined up in the encampment in the encampment Santa Ana Riverbed to speak with county workers tasked with placing the homeless in motel rooms for up to 30 days as sheriff's deputies begin clearing the trash and needles from the site. County officials said the challenge was ensuring that they were reaching all 600 homeless tent dwellers who had been living on the two-mile-long stretch of the riverbed bike trail since last summer. According to Frank Kim, the county's chief executive officer, quote, we're going to help everybody, but not everybody is going to get a motel voucher, end quote. What do you guys think about our tax dollars going towards giving the homeless motel rooms for up to 30 days? Well, that amount of dough, at the end of that 30 days, they're still homeless. So it's not a permanent. Uh, yeah, just what, throwing what happens money at after it 30 days? Work, well, what do you right? do then? Do you treat and street them? I mean, what, what's Theoretically, 30 days uh, with a roof over your head, a shower, you can go and get a job and start getting a paycheck, theoretically. But are they going to do that? Well, I mean, they're already homeless, and a lot of them are uh, – uh, able-bodied a lot of times and they I wonder don't what the success to. rate success rate is in that regard as far as employment and you know somewhat permanent employment following 30 days in a motel I didn't hear anything uh, about vocational retraining I didn't hear anything about job placement skills just gonna put them up in a in a hotel in, in a motel well it's also going to be a lot of mental illness it's going to be a lot of substance abuse right so you're going to be dealing with in my opinion, probably majority substance abuse and mental illness and a minority of people there due to hard economic times. 
the people who are there for the hard economic times, they'll be happy to get the the, the motel room. Uh, the people who are there for drugs and uh, mental illness, they'll probably drift right out of that motel room the moment you give it to them, and they'll still be back on the street right where you left them. Uh, what interesting though is these lawyers who file this uh, injunction and all of this. Maybe they should offer their houses. <laughs> you know. If you, if you care about these people so much, right, you don't want to inconvenience them, maybe you should open your home, <laughs> right? Uh, you, know, you know, lead with example, but they don't do that. They have just enough, you know, compassion to leave them suffering on the street, and it makes me a little uh, uh, uncomfortable. Speaking of Robert being uncomfortable, I've got a story. Robert doesn't know I'm going to read this, but I know this is near and dear to his heart. He's looking at me. Steve, what are you talking about? Okay. <coughs> After Robert. After 116 years in business and following years of attacks, fines, and losses incurred by federal bureaucrats, Gibson Guitars, the legendary manufacturer of electric guitars, revealed that it could face bankruptcy this coming July. Indeed, this hallowed name in the field of modern music and manufacturer of the instrument based on Les Paul's 1947 invention will probably fall prey to Uncle Sam. Mm, interesting. Uh, Doesn't really have anything to do with work comp, uh, workers' compensation, employment, and labor law, but I mean, I play guitar. Robert, I know you play guitar. Mike, you like to listen to guitar. Scott, Uncle Studios, I mean... He's a he, key man. He, 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 he engineers the show. He plays music. He writes music. He sings. You know, Les, uh, Gibson Guitar is going bankrupt. Unbelievable. It's too bad they got into money problems. Maybe they can... Uh, it's a pretty big name. It's one of the... You know, it's 50% of the, the big names. The other is Fender. The, the other is Fender, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's the Pepsi and the Coke, right? Right. Uh and usually there's always a buyer for such a name, uh, even when they fall on hard times. But uh, not really surprising that people in the music industry would mismanage their money, right? <laughs> not, 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 not exactly a shocker there. They might, they might want to take it a different direction, you know? Pay perhaps hire a businessman rather than a musician, someone who uh, must love guitars and worked his way up in the company, something like that. Yeah. You know, maybe a little direction would change. Yeah, a little directional change never hurts. I mean, you have to uh, learn with the times, move with the times, and uh, that's all about business. Mike, I think you've got the next news story before the next break. U.S. evangelist Billy Graham, who counseled presidents and preached to millions across the world from his native North Carolina to communist North Korea during his 70 years in the pulpit, died today, Wednesday, at the age of 99. With his steely features and piercing blue eyes, Graham was a powerful figure when he preached in his prime on stage hoisting a Bible and, as he declared Jesus Christ, to be the only solution to humanity's problems. According to his ministry, he preached to more people than anyone else in history, reaching hundreds of millions of people either in person or via TV and satellite links. Graham became the de facto White House chaplain to several U.S. presidents, most famously Richard Nixon. He also met with scores of world leaders and was the most was the first noted evangelist to take his message behind the Iron Curtain. Thank you very much. You're listening to uh, Work Comp Matters. We're brought to you by A1 Law and Santa Monica Tickets. If you want the number one computer management system used by more California workers' compensation attorneys than any other system on the planet, give me a call at 818-357-4120 for your no-strings-attached money-back guarantee one dollar a day a one law and if you want those hard to get front row sold out concert sports theater tickets give our buddy brian a call at santa monica tickets 310-395-8587 if you're looking for a place to hear about uh, legalized marijuana in california the homeless autonomous cars Donald Trump, even though we don't have a Donald Trump story, um, you have tuned in to the right place. We've got the financial report coming up. We've got Where's Anna coming up. And um, we've got a musical break right now. Big 
slip and sliding on the upside of down. Let me tell you, baby, I have earned my crown. Lord, don't let me be misunderstood. Ain't got time to watch no grass grow. Poor I'm dancing with Romeo. Here's the ticket to the rodeo. Lord, come on and love me like you could. Don't say I ain't a lady. I'm a single mother, got a family. Sometimes you need a piece of candy. A little bit of something good. A little bit of something good. See, I drive carpool. And I do night school, social network. Oh, I got my arms around the world. Forget about your black book. Come on, baby, take a good look. Oh, the fish is jumping on the hook. Oh, don't think I want it, cause I would. Don't Say I ain't a lady I'm a single mother Got my family Sometimes you need a piece of candy A little bit of something good A little bit of something good Some folk rock sounds of Susan Scheller on Work Comp Matters were brought to you by A1 Law in Santa Monica. Tickets, if you want the number one computer management system used by more California workers' compensation attorneys than any other computer management system on the planet, give me a call at 818-357-4120 for your no-strings-attached money-back guaranteed $1 a day A1 Law. And if you want those hard-to-get, sold-out concert, sport, theater tickets, front row even, give our buddy Brian a call at 310-395-8587. Without further ado, about five and a half years ago, he came scrolling right up to my office. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He was asking for a job, and I hired him on the spot at $15 an hour. Now he's hung his own shingle. He's paying out thousands of dollars in uh, advertising. He's got thousands, well, maybe not thousands, but hundreds of clients He's an applicant attorney of record, and he's my protege with the Workers' Compensation Financial News Report, attorney Robert Ozeron. Good evening, everyone. This is attorney Robert Ozeron with the Work Comp Matters Financial Report for the week of February 21st, 2018. Heightened volatility in the stock market has fueled press coverage about recent declines and what to do about them. The general rule of thumb is a correction occurs when the market declines 10% from its 52-week high, whereas a bear market is not official until the decline is 20% or more below the recent high. Overall, the market has yet to see a bearish trend. A six-day rebound in world stocks began to sputter as bond markets borrowing costs regained traction and the dollar kicked firmly away from the three-year low. U.S. oil features futures are on a rise. Brent Crude oil prices fell, pulled down by a stronger dollar, and about a profit-taking. 
while U.S. futures gained, bringing the discount between the two key future contracts to a six-month low. Albertsons is scheduled to buy part of Rite Aid Corporation. HSBC Holdings reported a smaller-than-expected rise in annual profits and unveiled plans to raise up to $7 billion to bolster its capital. Notable companies reporting quarterly earnings today include Domino's Pizza and The Home Depot. Gold is $13.48 per ounce. Silver is $17.54 per ounce. Crude oil is $47.29 per barrel. And the average gallon of gas in California, $2.44. Oh, $2.44. This has been Attorney Robert Ozeron with the Work Comp Matters Financial Report for the week of February 7th. 2018. Yeah, I know those gas prices in Southern California are about a dollar more, probably about uh, uh, $3.30, $3.40 a gallon, because there's no way we see two and a half bucks here in Southern California. Well, I'm not sure if that includes taxes. Oh, I see. Uh, okay. That might just be the average gallon. Yeah. And then it, we pay, uh, you know, street taxes and uh, all sorts of uh, fuel emission taxes. I think we pay uh, CO2 taxes, right? And then coming in, in coming in the summer, we actually pay more taxes because the uh, the the gasoline is different in the summer than it is in the winter. It's chemically different, and therefore they charge an extra tax for that as well. Correct. But Correct. In, in California, we're taxed Plus to death. Plus, it costs I mean, what more else to produce also. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, Mike, I think you've got a new story coming up. Electric cars, robo-taxis, and self-driving trucks are coming to change the society we live in, possibly sooner than you think. Limited tests of driverless cars are already happening today, and they'll be in use everywhere within six years, according to Carlos Jossen, CEO of the Renault-Nissan Alliance. A change on that scale would reach far beyond the automotive industry to upend businesses, transform our daily lifestyles, and reshape cities. Ride-hailing services such as Uber Technologies and Lyft are already reducing demand for public transport across the U.S., according to a study from the University of California, Davis. People use ride-hailing apps instead of taking the train, driving, cycling, or even walking. Re removing humanoid drivers from the equation would make those services even more affordable and convenient compared with trains or buses following fixed routes. Dwindling passenger numbers could ultimately starve public transit of investment. Anybody remember a dude named Harvey Weinstein? Does that name sound <laughs> familiar? Had something to do with the Me Too movement and Time's Up a movement? Well, the Weinstein Company thought it had found a path to survival when a group of investors led by a respected businesswoman offered to acquire the company, rebrand it, and install a female-led board of directors. However, New York Attorney General Eric Schneiderman threw a wrench into the deal, filing a lawsuit against the company, partly out of concern that executives who failed to protect Harvey Weinstein's accusers would continue to run the operation. Apparently, just having a female-led board is not enough of a solution for Harvey. Well, you know what? You masturbate into potted plants, and that's what you get. What can I tell you? Well, I understand that the New York authorities are also concerned about preserving assets. Absolutely, sure. For later judgment. Later judgment. Uh, Robert, you got a, a news story for us, bud? Yeah, nearly two months after recreational marijuana became legal in California, less than 1% of the state's known growers have been licensed, according to a report released by the Pot Industry Group. A 38-page report from the California Growers Association says 0.78%, or 534, of an estimated 68,150 marijuana growers were licensed by the state as of February 7th. The association in its reporting released this week cited such obstacles to licensing as costs and regulatory barriers. A study published last year by the University of California Agricultural Issues Center estimated the newly created state market for recreational marijuana should produce $5 billion in tax taxable revenue, 
this year. The Growers Association, which identifies itself as the state's largest association of marijuana businesses, said it hopes to work with officials in getting more growers licensed. You know, uh, speaking of licensing, I saw something on Facebook recently. I asked Robert's permission before the show if it was okay to bring it up. I saw your advertisement on this big 18-wheeler or something like that, and I said, that is awesome. Was it a moving vehicle, Robert? Well, it's a, it's kind of like a mobile billboard. It's on a moving van, like a like a truck. Looks like a bus. Yeah, it's a big truck, and it's a it's just an advertising company, and they offer you know for you to put your poster board or your billboard right on the side of a truck, and uh, it's, I think it, it is cheaper than a standalone billboard that's over a billboard. I, I am all about thinking outside the box, and this is clearly thinking outside the box. You know, when when we see uh you know the the uh, uh, the buses that drive up and down uh, the the major streets, and we see the movies advertised, and we see plays advertised. Here's Ozeron Law, 310-999-9989, if I got that right. Yep. Well, the amazing and thing was There's that it some was just... guy pulling his hair out saying, if you have <laughs> stress. stress at work, you know, what a great idea, my boy. How'd you think of that? Well, actually, they, they come to me. <laughs> oh, they gave you a call. Yeah. They say, hey, we sell advertising to lawyers. Would you be interested? And I took a look. You know, I get a lot of these calls. Uh, some of them are frauds. It's true. They look to prey on the greedy lawyers who think that it's going to be easy to generate, uh, you know, client interest. Uh, so, you know, you have to be very cautious. You also don't want to do business with any cappers. Right. You don't want them to be right, too aggressive. Right. 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 You, know, you have to see where they're coming from. So you got to investigate their business, ask to see their website. Right. What other customers do you have? What would it look like? Make sure it doesn't violate any solicitation rules. Right. But, but it's all pretty basic stuff with, if it's clean, you know, clean advertising. Now, how, how long have you been advertising on the, the, the 18 wheeler or whatever the heck it is? Well, what you saw is actually not even out yet. Really? Correct. So, yeah, you're bringing up stuff that's not even I, there I, I, I was going to ask you, how many calls have you got from the ad yet? <laughs> well, <laughs> only yours, <laughs> showing you an idea. And You're clairvoyant, Steve. Yeah. yeah. Well, I hope that it's going to be as successful as you think it will be. I, I, I think it will be very successful. The Division of Workers' Compensation has suspended 20 more medical providers from participating in California's workers' compensation system, bringing the total number of providers suspended to 197. The providers were suspended for fraud or other criminal actions or for the loss of their license. Of course, I said a long time ago, I'm just tired and sick of naming all the names. So if you want the names, if you want the licenses, if you want the specialties, go ahead and check out the DWC website. My name is Steve Appel. You're listening to Work Comp Matters. Um, if you want to hear about legalization of marijuana, the homeless, autonomous cars, although not tonight, Donald Trump, you know, give us a call anytime you want. 818-357-4120. As always, we're brought to you by A1 Law and Santa Monica Tickets. If you want the number one computer management system, used by more workers' compensation attorneys than any other system on the planet, give us a call at 818-357-4120. If you want those hard-to-get, sold-out, concerts, sports, theater tickets, even front row, give our buddy Brian a call at Santa Monica Tickets, 310-395-8587. We'll be back with Where's Anna after the next musical break. Some folks said they're gonna hang him so high Cause you just can't do what he did 
Here goes the last DJ Who plays what he wants to play And says what he wants to say Hey, hey, hey And there goes your freedom of choice And there goes the last human voice And there goes the last DJ Sometimes it'll kind of come in And I'll bust a move And remember how it was back then And there goes the last DJ Who plays what he wants to play And says what he wants to say Hey, hey, hey And there goes your freedom of choice He was in my life for 40 years, and then he died last year due to prescription medication, Tom Petty, and the last DJ. Uh, Coming up now uh, is our uh, segment, which I started earlier in the year. Um, I've known Anna Montez Gluck for uh, at least uh, 10 years. Um, She's not only attractive, she's not only wild, Um, She's not only straight and sincere, but she knows a hell of a lot uh, about workers' compensation. Um, I've asked Anna uh, for quite a while uh, to come on the show, but unfortunately, uh, she is just taking care of business. She's taking care of her family. She's paying her bills like any legitimate uh, 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 professional would. So I have felt I'm going to have to give her an incentive to come on. Uh, back about 40 years ago, Santa, uh, Santa Monica tickets. Back about 40 years ago, Saturday Night Live offered the Beatles a certain amount of money to come on the show. And although they never came on as a group, uh, they came on individually. So I feel I have to sweeten the pot. Anna Montez Gluck or any of her friends or family or colleagues that are listening, I am here to offer Anna Montez Gluck $750 in advertising or advertising to her favorite charity to come on the show for one night to be with us guys at Work Comp Central. And uh, you have my word on it. That's old school. It's the handshake agreement. It's the same thing that I had with WorkComp Central over a year ago. This is not an employment situation. This is an independent contractor basis. No, I don't want Anna Montez Gluck as my employee, but I definitely want her here in the studio for one hour, and I will give $750 in advertising directly to her or her favorite charity to come on the show and be interviewed. And that is Where's Anna? And um, I don't know if she's ever going to be able to make it, but when she does, I'm still looking forward to it. Who's got the next news story? I believe I do. <clears throat> American International Group, AIG, p- posted a $6.7 billion fourth quarter loss last week as the U.S. insurer booked a big charge related to the U.S. tax reform and losses from global catastrophes. Excluding one-time items, adjusted fourth quarter earnings were $526 million compared with a, an adjusted loss of $2.8 billion in the same period a year earlier. <coughs> Excuse me. 
AIG booked $762 million of catastrophe losses during the quarter, largely from wildfires that raged through California and caused significant damages to homes and businesses. The quarter also reflected a modest reserve boost to cover future claims driven by losses in its international commercial businesses. You know, AIG's got a lot of hoots, but I'm going to tell you why. It's the only insurance company I've ever heard of or ever known where they change their name. They change their name to Chartis because of the uh, what went down with them. And then within a year, they changed their name back to AIG. Sort of like everybody forgot about it. We'll go back to AIG. Wow. Who needs Chartis? Wow. Uh, Robert, you've got the next news story. States laws banning handheld cell phone calls while driving can be effective in reducing teens' handheld conversations while driving. But texting bans are not effective in reducing texting while driving, according to a new study. Teen drivers reported 55% fewer hand-to-hand phone calls, or I should say handheld phone calls, uh, when universal handheld calling bans were in place compared to states with no bans. Universal texting bans did not fully discourage teens from texting while driving. Bans limited to just young drivers were not effective in reducing either handheld conversations or texting. Even with laws in place, about one-third of teen drivers are still talking on the phone and or texting while driving. Uh, Okay, I'm going to be the first one to admit this story did not write correctly. This story did not sound correctly. I'm going to take the blame, okay? Um, I write the show Work Comp Matters, I produce the show Work Comp Matters, I direct the show Work Comp Matters, and gosh darn it, I'm responsible for Work Comp Matters. What was wrong with this? This show did not, this article did not write correctly, I'm going to tell you what. What it's essentially saying is that although teenagers and young adults have lessened the amount of time that they're talking on the phone while driving, the amount of time that they are texting while driving is not reduced. And it it just didn't, the story didn't write correctly. And it's something that I, I, I don't know if the story is correct or not. I mean, I assume it is, but I, I don't understand how teenagers and young adults are still texting while driving. Could I mean, it be voice activated text. Yeah, I, I I love voice activated text software. Uh, I use it all the time, but it it didn't make sense to me how people using their phones while driving, talking on the phones has been cut down, but texting on the phones still remains the same. And the story just wrote very poorly. So Well you're you're a great speaker, but <laughs> you know, I think I should stop right there. <laughs> My boy, thank you very much for the compliment. I appreciate it. And that was probably two minutes that probably should have never been spoken about. So there you go. Mike, give us the next news story. I'm hearing crickets. When baseball season opens March 29th. Oh, I now see, it's, it's wonderful. I followed up a crappy news story with a wonderful news story. Go for it, Mike. Tis the season. When the baseball season opens March 29, all 30 teams will have extended netting in place. It's about time, folks. Last week, during Major League Baseball's quarterly owners' meetings, the Tampa Bay Rays and the Arizona Diamondbacks announced that they would be adding protective netting in front of the seats along first and third base at their stadiums. In doing so, they became the 29th and 30 teams to conclude that additional netting was needed to protect fans from screaming foul balls and flying broken bats. And so now all of the teams are in compliance with this new safety standard. Fantastic. 
It We're, used to be part of the fun that you could you could possibly die if you don't keep pay attention. You know, that used to be part of the, of the attraction. Risk, right? The assumption of the risk. Yeah, that was part of the attraction when you were a kid, when you were going with your dad. It's like, you keep your head up, you know, you might get taken off here. To and, this day, and, I don't and, go into the parking lot without my glove. And, and, and Mike Mike told me that someone actually died by, being, uh, by sitting in that area. That's what prompted the extension, yeah. The, somebody unfortunately got, I believe, hit with a bat... Um, oh, it wasn't a ball. It was a bat. I'm not recalling. Well, either it, one can do it. Yeah, either one can yeah. do it. I don't know, but you know, they they it was uh, dreadful. Yeah, it and seems avoidable. Like, seems like uh, injury lawsuits is pretty much what makes people change their behavior, right? Absolutely, a, a potential liability. Absolutely, without question. Yeah, that's actually one of the things they talk about when you're starting out in law school is the effect of uh, you know lawsuits and what they do to our uh, our culture. You know, and the way we we have our uh, our safety standards. And we've all always said on Work Comp Matters, follow the money, you'll get your answer. Yeah, and usually they don't want to lose it. <laughs> right, right. <coughs> by um, being by being negligent. Make making money is not necessarily difficult. It's holding on to your money that you make. That well, there's always someone else, you know, trying to make tr- money or take it away from you. Yeah, and if you violated the law, then <coughs> then they have a, a legal right. Uh, and people are very aggressive about that, it, especially know. in California. Especially one in of the California, more, if not the most litigious state in the union. Yeah, but again, uh, you know, you don't need to go that far for someone getting killed from a broken bat because they're out to have an enjoyable evening, and then someone in their family is dead. That seems a bit much for what uh, a net that must have cost a one-time fee of maybe a thousand bucks with installation right i mean it's probably more like twenty five thousand <coughs> because you have to string it and t- make sure it's taunt and everything oh wow and it lasts at, forever whatever, whatever. yeah yeah, yeah. 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 And they're, they're giving contracts out like, like you know i think it was millions. a ball i'm recalling it was a ball and I, it was I a woman was in a her ball. like 60s or early 60s or maybe late 50s and she you know i don't know i see people not paying attention <coughs> well, yes, which which is why they're so insistent that when you have a beach ball at a baseball game, they want to grab that beach ball. It's not because it distracts the players. It's because it distracts the fans from looking at the game and the potential of the ball I coming hate your the beach way. Beach balls officially uh, let you know. I hate, if if beach, ball, beach balls come within my purview, I smash them myself. I hate them. Well, you're supposed to smash them. You're supposed to smash them and then keep knocking them to another person, and it just floats around the arena. I mean, take the air out is what I'm talking about. Oh, uh, you're going to get a collective groan from the people that I way. That's that. not how you become a man of the people. I love that. <laughs> All right. Well, you're not running for politics, huh? <laughs> the man who's... No, but I am ready for Dodger <laughs> Stadium, I'll tell you that. There you yeah. go. Well, there you know you what? Go. In Dodger Stadium, there's a lot of people with sharp objects, so I'd be careful. I'd be careful out there. You know, you, uh, you stab that ball, someone takes it the wrong way. I'd be careful. But... Uh, I think we were talking about the gun debate earlier in the show. We never really got back to it. Right. Right. We were talking about the Second Amendment. I know Trump just signed that bump uh, stock uh, ban, apparently. It's been on his desk he, since the last encur- shooting. He's encouraging the bump stock uh, ban. That's correct. It's interesting to see Trump moving forward at all uh, in regards to uh, firearm regulation. And, you know, uh, this is not something people who voted Republican necessarily thought he would do whatsoever. Well, he had a bunch of people in the Oval Office or wherever at the White House today with their discussion regarding this stuff. But I think he also mentioned something about a mental health reform in, in America. And I would love to see that take place. I'd like to see that happen before we start infringing on the rights of lawful citizens, okay? I'm not against, I think most people aren't against uh, some sort of regulation. You know, you want to keep guns out of the, the hands of the mentally ill, out of the felons. But it's got to be reasonable. And you have to remember the spirit of the Second Amendment, which is to keep the power in the hands of the people and not in the government, right? It's not for hunting. It's not for self-defense. The reason that it's right number two in the Bill of Rights Number one is where we establish, you know, what we have as freedoms. We have the preamble where we talk about how our government's going to operate. We said the first right is they can never take the right of this, this, and this away from you. Religion, press, assembly, right, a speech. The second right is if, if they try to infringe on number one, we have number two. It's, it's, it's a collective insurance policy. That's the way it was drafted. That's I agree the, with that. It's to stop a tyrannical government. Now, people believe because we operate in such a way that we would never do such a thing 
right? Governments, we, I mean, sure, other governments take away guns from their citizens and become tyrannical. We've seen it in history if anybody studies history. Uh, you know, but uh, people have a naivete that we could ever reach that level in America. At the same time, you turn on the news and they are, you know, stoking up racial hatred every chance they get. Uh, so it's a very interesting mix where they're stoking up hatred on one side, uh, trying to create some sort of race war if you really get very uh, negative about, you know, their intent, uh, or at least a division of the, you know, of the American people. Who's they? Who's the they? The leftist about? media. I see. Or the Russians. Well, you know what? Hillary. Russians Hil love to stir it up. Yeah, well, they, you know, the Russians and then Hillary, they have their dossier together that they've compiled and. Uh, they're all in bed together as far as I'm concerned. Well, but 13 indictments were just uh, thrown down about the Russians, and basically the evidence is that they were attempting to polarize the nation, not necessarily throw the election to one side or the other, but just polarize both the sides. Well, divide and conquer your enemy. Yes, exactly correct. Yeah, create chaos and destruction, yeah. It makes sense. That's also why I believe after those indictments, nothing was even related to the Trump team, the uh, campaign team. Well, I think Russia is a little out of our jurisdiction. Well, we did just bomb like, what, 30 of their uh, non-governmental uh, fighters in Syria, right? Their mercenary group. When did that happen? It happened last week. You don't know. Trump killed a whole bunch of them in well, one then, bombing. Well, then the Ruskies are killing back to killing indiscriminately in that last rebel-held town. And that's got to be Putin, and that's got to be Ruskies. And I, well, don't get me started on Ruski. I'm Polish. And uh, that's going to about do it. I know Robert has a ton more to say. It's going to have to wait till next week. This has been a fantastic show. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, for my right hand man who keeps me in check and out of trouble at least 90% of the time, Mike Zima. Uh, my protege, uh, attorney, Robert Ozeron. Scott's on the board from Uncle Studios, uh, halfway around the world, 45-year attorney. He's still got his bar card, John Scalia. All of the good people back at WorkComp Central who continue to approve and support of this project, including but not limited to Leaf File and Jake Paris. My name is Steve Appel. We'll see you again next week for another edition of WorkComp Matters. Matters.